management versus risk assessment. Even me today is uh, Dr. Seth Geitman. Uh, Seth is a professor of the Department of Industrial and Operations and Engineering and the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Michigan. Uh, Seth, thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, his research is a risk analysis, often very interdisciplinary, and recently he's been focusing on urban and infrastructure resilience and sustainability in a changing climate, which in the case of our state, we will spend more time talking about, especially with so much of our plans on the coast. He was also one of the main consultants in the development of ISA, the risk assessment matrix. So please welcome Seth. Well, welcome. And I was asked to talk about risk assessment versus risk management. Let me find my slide for a minute. So Andrew asked me to, to explain the difference between risk assessment and risk management. And once I find my slide, please. Ah, there you go. Excellent. So this isn't so much going to be talking about research that I do. It's going to be more kind of basics of what's the difference between risk assessment and risk management. What are some of the tools that are used in each of these different areas? And then some thoughts on how this has been put together in some other areas. This afternoon, I'm going to be talking more about some of the research that we've done on, on storm outage uh, modeling for utilities. So I'm going to talk about what is risk assessment. That is, what, what, when we start to think about risk assessment, what is risk? What, what is risk assessment? What are some of the tools that get used across different um, industries in different areas? Then switch to what is risk management. Talk about some of the overview of tools that get used there in a wide range from qualitative to advanced quantitative tools. I have half an hour, so I'm not going to turn you into an expert on all these different tools. But I'm trying to give you an overview of what some of these things are and offer some uh, opinions and advice on that. And then talk about a possible hierarchical approach that has been used in the past. Can everybody in the back hear me OK? All right. So we think about risk analysis and risk assessment, risk management. These words can mean many different things. The Society for Risk Analysis is the main international society for risk analysis. And they divide it up this way, that risk analysis is comprised of risk assessment and risk management. And then along with that, risk perception, risk communication, risk governance, and a lot of these other issues. So they see risk assessment and risk management as the two big parts of risk analysis. In Europe, sometimes they'll swap the assessment and analysis here, the assessment will go to the top of the analysis, so they got lower left the box. But regardless, you've got the risk assessment and the risk management. So what are these things? So risk assessment is really asking, what is the risk? Nothing about what should we do about it. Risk management is, OK, now what can we do about it? What should we do about it? How do we make those decisions? So we'll use this as our, our starting point here. We can look at a classic view of what risk assessment is. So this is a paper from 1981, Catherine McGarrick, first issue of the journal Risk Analysis. It says risk assessment is really addressing three questions. What can go wrong? With what likelihood? And what consequences? But if you're going to do a risk assessment, you're dealing with those three things. You're not asking the question, what should I do about it? That's part of risk management, which we'll get to in a while. So what can go wrong with what likelihood and what consequences? Now, Kaplan and Garrett, they were a couple of nuclear engineers. Uh, this was 1981, so this is shortly after the Three Mile Island accident in the US. It's very focused on these sorts of systems, but it applies broadly across many different areas of application. So what could go wrong with what likelihood and what consequences? So let's look at these a little bit. So what can go wrong? Well, does a risk assessment really have to deal only with negative outcomes? Or can we also think about positive outcomes in, as we're doing our risk assessment? The Kaplan and Garrett framework says no, it's about what can go wrong. Maybe now we argue, no, we also need to think about the positive things that are associated with these systems. So if we're thinking about urban trees, we're not just asking, what's all the bad stuff that could happen? We also need to ask, well, what are the benefits of these trees? How do we balance those costs and benefits? There are many different tools and techniques out there for trying to identify what can go wrong. Uh, your most basic one is brainstorming. What could happen in this situation? What sorts of, of unfortunate outcomes, undesirable outcomes, or, or positive outcomes could we see? There's risk lists. So these are widely used in many industries. It's saying, OK, well, let's just start a list of all the things that could go wrong, often coupled with a brainstorming type approach. So I've done risk analysis with uh, NASA for Mars missions, and they use risk lists. These, these are qualitative but powerful tools to help you get a handle on things. Then there's a lot of industry-specific sorts of tools and techniques. 
Um, and there's some for forestry as well. But some of these it has often swift or more for process industries, there's industries specific checklists, things like this. This is trying to get at just the question of what can go wrong. And this really depends on having an understanding of that system. And a big one that gets used a lot is FMEA, failure modes and effects analysis, or FMECA, failure modes and effects and criticality analysis. So these are formalized tools to try and get at what are the failure modes of that system. So you can picture taking a tree and saying, okay, what are the failure modes of this tree? What targets are there within um, a reasonable range of that? What are the effects of this? And then how can we use these tools to try and better assess that risk? And then when you get into more technical systems, like engineered systems, you get functional block diagrams and lots of other tools like that. There are lots of tools out there. So you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel when you're uh, starting to do risk analysis. There's lots of tools out there. Well, let's think about the likelihood part. What does likelihood mean? Does it have to be probability? Does it have to be quantitative to call it a likelihood? No. Um, and is probability the only about measure of likelihood? No. There, but if you're going to use probability, which a lot of risk analysts do, there's two basic types, frequentist invasion. So frequentist probability, it looks at the long run frequency with which an event happens. So you need lots of data, right? So if I'm doing a risk assessment for a power system that's going to be impacted by a hurricane, I can get lots of data, unfortunately, because we've had lots of hurricanes impacting power systems. So I can use all this data and formulate a risk assessment for that power system. <coughs> Okay, I can use that and then I can use that to project out into the future of what are the impacts of this hurricane on these trees around this, these power lines and what are the impacts of that on power outages. But in many cases, we don't have that level of data. We'd like to have the data, but often we don't. So in many cases, we're using the Bayesian approach where what we're representing is your expert knowledge about that system. Because people know a lot about trees. People know a lot about power systems. People know a lot about these different types of systems and the Bayesian approach allows us to leverage that. Then we don't have to wait until we get lots of data to do a risk assessment, which for some systems is good because thankfully the really bad events don't happen very often, so we just don't have much data. So we've got these two different perspectives on what probability means. But we also need to see beyond probability. Even if we're going to be quantitative, we have to go back to the qualitative side. Uh, because the state of information we have in any given situation might be very different, right? So consider two admittedly concocted cases here, where we've got a tree number one, which is carefully assessed by multiple master arborists using the best available technology over a period of multiple days. They judge the tree to have a moderate likelihood of trunk failure in the next year. So that's tree number one. Tree number two, we have a really quick drive-by inventory of the neighborhood, and somebody says, oh, that one probably is a moderate uh, chance of failure. I didn't really get a chance to look at it much, but hey, it's moderate. Same assessed likelihood of failure, but very, very different information bases. And if your risk assessment tool doesn't capture that, you're missing a lot of valuable information. There's been approaches and techniques that have been developed where you say, okay, yes, we've got our, our formalized risk assessment, um, but now let's capture the information base behind that. Right? Because in some cases, we're just making some assumptions. In other cases, we've done a full-on assessment, and we have gone and we've got a lot more information. We need to find a way to represent that so that you, if you see a risk matrix or uh, a risk list or whatever it is, that you can tell the difference between those two situations. Because the information isn't the same. When you think about a risk analysis, it's really about information. Right? We're trying to provide information to decision makers. Ultimately, that's what we want to do. We want to support decision making. And we need to convey the information in a way that, that represents truthfully what the information actually is represents it clearly in a way that the decision maker will understand. And different decision makers will want to see different things. But we'll come back to that. Okay, so now I'm going to put on my professor hat for a minute talk about U versus P. So U is uncertainty and P is probability. So uncertainty is a concept. I mean, we have a lack of certainty. Uh, probability is one possible measure of uncertainty, but it's only one possible measure. There are many other measures of uncertainty. And there are many in the risk analysis community arguing that we need to take more of an uncertainty-centric view of risk assessment, not a probability-centric view of risk assessment. Because the probability doesn't capture the underlying knowledge base. There may be some cases where we understand that particular system really well. Great. But there's other cases where we don't. We don't know what's going on inside that tree. 
So we need to, to have, in, in conjunction with those risk assessments, we need to have a qualitative assessment of the underlying knowledge base. There's a group in Norway uh, led by Roger Plug and Tari Aven who developed a way to try and do this with risk assessments. It says, okay, yes, you do your risk assessment, you use the existing tools, but in parallel, you do an, an assessment of the strength of knowledge that underlies that risk assessment. What assumptions are you making? What happens if those assumptions are wrong? Where, do, where are my big holes in information? So I can go out and get more information, where should I focus? So it's trying to provide an additional layer of information to, the, to decision makers. So they see risk assessments for three different uh, trees. They'll understand what the information content is underneath those. Because they might all say roughly the same thing risk-wise, but one might have a whole lot more information. You'd be a lot more confident making decisions based on that risk assessment. So I think this is an important thing to, to look at as we move forward, is capturing that underlying uh, knowledge base. Okay, and then we think about consequences. We often think consequences are the easy part, right? Um, financial losses, death, injury. But we need to also think broadly, uh, and we heard some of this in the first talk, thinking about ecosystem resilience, attachment to place, loss of amenity services, legal costs of failures and possibly political risks associated with tree management and tree failures. That is, consequences aren't just the easy things to capture. Consequences are much broader. And particularly once we start thinking urban trees, you've got a lot of other factors at play there. How do we capture that in a risk assessment? That can be hard. Okay, so I have to stop and have a note on risk matrices. So a risk matrix is not a risk assessment tool. That might surprise some of you. A risk, uh, a risk matrix is a risk communication tool. Risk matrices are very broadly used. Um, some people love them. Some people don't like them at all. Um, they can be very useful when used properly. Right? It's a good way to convey risk information, but somehow you have to assess that risk information to put into the matrix. Right? So it's a communication tool. So it says, okay, well, my consequence is three, and my likelihood is three, so that's a medium risk. Well, there's some problems with risk matrices. One is the lack of precision in the terminology too often. What is a three and what is a three? We don't know from this particular risk matrix. There has to be the, the documentation with it. There's some other issues too, but keep in mind that a, a risk matrix doesn't assess the risk for you. A risk matrix represents the risk that you've assessed some, in some other way. So you have to have a very clear way of assessing, well, what's the likelihood, right? So if you look at a risk management standard, it'll give you some, it should, give you some guidance on what a three means. Sometimes with risk matrices used rather than one, two, three, four, you'd see probabilities. So between 1% and 10% a year, for example, that'd be one range. Whenever you have a risk matrix, make sure you understand how they're defining these different uh, parts of it. So you need to be really careful that you understand what it is. There's some other issues with risk matrices to be careful of. Sometimes there are bigger issues than others. Uh, one is the lack of resolution. So here we've got five consequence categories. Sometimes you'll see three, sometimes you'll see seven. But you're binning everything into, in this case, five. Right? Does that give you the resolution you need? Sometimes that's all you need. Sometimes you need more than that. So it's not a one size fits all. And then there's also a, a challenge in that there's sometimes correlation between assess frequency and assess consequence. So for example, if I have an event that if it happens, it's really disastrous. Well, what's frequent mean? Does frequent mean the same thing as if it's an event that happens with, um, and when it happens, not much happens to me, right? So I commute my bike, so maybe one event is I have a flat tire. The other event is I get hit by a car. What's frequent for a flat tire versus what's frequent for getting hit by a car? Right, so frequent in, in an individual's mind may depend on what the consequence is, but in the risk matrix, it can't, right? Because you need an absolute, but frequent means whatever, once a, once a month or once a year, right? So you have to be really careful with that when you're doing these assessments that you understand what the person means when they say it's frequent, right? So a tree falling on a house and um, killing people, what's frequent for that versus a limb falls off and there's nobody there? Okay, so you have to be really careful with that. So takeaway message on risk matrices, they can be useful. They can be really useful. They're a risk communication tool, not a risk assessment tool. They can be useful. I don't want to make you think they're not. But be careful with what they actually mean. Okay, so why might we do a risk assessment? Well, there's different reasons. One is it might be required by law, or by a policy, or by a supervisor, right? So sometimes we do a risk assessment because we have to. 
So my brother works for the U.S. Um, Department of Ag and he was in charge of environmental impact assessments for a region of the country, and they, a lot of those are done because they're legally required to. Okay, that, that's a valid reason to do a risk assessment. Sometimes we do a risk assessment to ascertain if a risk is acceptable or not. That is, make a go no, a go or no go decision. This might may or may not be required by law. But sometimes we do a risk assessment to provide the basis for allocating resources for managing risk. I would say this is where we want to be. We want to say we have resources that we're going to use to manage risk. Now let's do a risk assessment to figure out how to allocate those resources. Ideally, if this is being required by law, so it's your environmental impact statement or something else like that, it's going to inform decision making. But sometimes it's just done because you have to do it. Right? Government regulations, we've got to meet them. When you look at the quality of the risk assessment, it can vary quite a bit, right? And sometimes those that are done to meet the, the requirements but are never going to actually be used for decision making are not necessarily the high quality. That's not always the case. Sometimes they're great. You want to have the, your risk assessment really oriented towards how do we best use our available resources to manage risk. So that's where we want to get. <clears throat> okay, so that takes us into risk management. Risk management focuses on what, if anything, one can or should do to manage risk in a given situation. Right, so going back to my example, bike commuting, well, what, what steps should I take to manage risk on my bike commuting? Right? There's lots of things that could go wrong. Some of them are pretty bad, some of them are not. Well, okay, I can wear bright reflective clothing. I can make sure I have lights. These are all risk management steps. I can um, make sure I have a tire pump to pump up the tires. All risk management steps. And when we think that through, we have to think about well, what resources do we have? Resources are not infinite, right? We all face limited resources. How do we use what we have to manage risk? But we're also balancing manage risk, managing risk against all the other things we can do with those resources. Right? We could go invest in planting more trees if our funds are flexible enough to go across categories. Or we could focus more on the risk management. How do we strike those balances? One of the key challenges with risk management is that it's really dependent on what one values. Right? So if I, if I value one thing one way and somebody else values something differently, I can't necessarily say I'm going to make the same decision. So often when we think about risk assessment versus risk management, it's often presented as the risk assessment is supposed to be the quote objective part. That is, we keep the values out of that part. So we're trying to get an objective assessment of what the risk actually, actually is. When we go to make decisions, now we have to consider what do we want? What are our objectives? What is it we're trying to achieve that is inherently value-based? And that sometimes is hard for people to realize or accept. Right? So often we say, we want a hard divide between risk assessment and risk management. Keep risk assessment objective. Risk management, we have to think about those values and those objectives. And when we think about risk management actions, there's really three types. Reduce the probability of an undesirable event. That is, we mitigate the probability. Second is reduce the consequences of the failure if they do occur, that is, mitigation of consequences. And the third is allocate a all or a portion of those costs to someone else if the failure does occur. So that's the insurance or the catastrophic bond type option. So if you think about a house sitting um, in a coastal area and it might be flooded during a hurricane. But we think about reducing the probability of an undesirable event that could be raising the house. Right? So we're reducing the chance of flooding. We try to reduce the consequences that might be move all the valuable stuff up to the second floor. We're going to ignore hurricane winds and roof crops from it. And then the third is, well, we'll buy insurance that will cover the cost of flooding. And the right mix might be some, some mix of those three things. Right? So if you think about your own house, if you're living in a floodplain, you probably have some mix of those three things. Maybe that elevates your home, but maybe. Um, and it's really that mix that you're trying to figure out. So a few examples of different types of actions. So when you think about mitigating probability, you can think about selective pruning or bracing or strapping or other sorts of things where you're trying to reduce the failure of the tree, the likelihood of the failure of the tree. You're not necessarily affecting the consequences if it does happen. So we think about that, the recent article about the magnolia tree at the White House. There are lots of steps to taken to try and keep that thing from failing. Um, there's also potentially some severe impacts if it doesn't work. To mitigate consequences, well, you could avoid parking under the tree. You could avoid camping under uh, trees during high winds and things like that. I remember taking our kids out for a Cub Scout camp out and waking up in the morning, we see somebody's pit, and then we look up at the tree and say, yeah, you probably shouldn't have slept there um, because there's a windstorm and there's a branch that's partially disconnected already. Um, so mitigating consequences and things like that, that is reducing the consequences if a failure does happen. It doesn't necessarily change the probability of the failure happening. 
and then allocating cost to a third party, or you could potentially buy insurance that might cover tree damage, um, cover failures when it happens. This is really most applicable to the financial part. Right now, so you can get reimbursed for some of the other things, but this is really a financial transaction. Okay, so there's many different frameworks out there for risk management. Lots and lots of frameworks for how to think about risk. And they're often grounded in very different approaches for decision making. So when we, when we think risk management, it's really about decision making. So when you ask, how do you make a decision? Well, there's lots of different ways that people make decisions. There's lots of different approaches that people have developed to help support that decision-making process. So I created a list here, there are others, but these are given in, in kind of increasing mathematical, order of increasing mathematical sophistication. So the precautionary and cautionary principle, I'll kind of lump those two together, we'll talk about that. No math at all. Alar and Alara, um, sometimes used interchangeably but slightly differently. Cost-benefit and extension, cost-benefit risk analysis. So now we start to get a little more mathematical. Uh, decision analysis, robust optimization, and ro robust decision making. And I'll give away part of the punchline up front. Some of these you would never use during your risk management decision making. For <coughs> we'll come back to that. Okay, so the precautionary principle. The basic philosophy here is that if, activity, if an activity could reasonably cause harm, avoid that activity. Right, so if we're not sure about something, we should just avoid it if it could potentially cause significant harm. We tend to not use this as much in the US as they do in Europe for risk management, but it is used. So example, and, and this is a real example, there's a, sign, a suggestion that starting the CERN super collider in Europe could create a black hole that would swallow the Earth and end civilization. Okay, uh, people actually publish this as a real concern. So the precautionary principle would say, don't start it. Risk analysts said, uh, wait a minute, there's a lot of benefits to CERN for science and other things. So they actually did a back the envelope calculation of what the probability of CERN swallowing the Earth would be. Um, and they started CERN, and everything was fine. Um, but the precautionary principle is used in a case like that, of saying, well, don't do it if, if it might cause that larger harm. Right? So when we think about how this would be applied to trees, we have to be a little bit careful. We'll come back to that. Uh, the likelihood of the outcome doesn't directly come into uh, consideration in the precautionary principle. When we think about ALARP and ALARA, ALARP is as low as reasonably possible, ALARA is as low as reasonably achievable. Call it roughly the same thing for our, our argument saying. It has to do with technology availability for ALARA. Um, but it's used more commonly in the US than in Europe, though it has been used for environmental cleanup decision making in the US. So EPA, um, especially in the late 80s and early 90s when they were dealing a lot with Superfund sites, had some ALARA and ALARP based approaches. So the philosophy seeks to reduce risk, provided that the costs of doing so are reasonable, in some definition of reasonable, and that's where it gets tricky. Um, there's no formal benefit cost trade-off analysis with these types of methods. For, so for example, in groundwater cleanup efforts, they'll often seek to reduce the risk of, of an additional cancer death to 10 to the minus six, unless the cost of doing so are grossly disproportionate. So it's not quite the same as the precautionary principle, but it's sort of similar, but you have to have a reasonability of costs involved. Then we get into cost-benefit analysis. And this is kind of, if you're an undergrad engineer, this is what you learn in your engineering economic class. So OK, we take the cost, we take the benefits, we balance them, and whatever gives us the best benefit cost ratio, for example, that's the one we do. Uh, so it's grounded in very traditional economic approaches. So for example, decide whether or not to remove a, remove a large tree with minor stem decay. Well, the potential outcomes to balance. You've got the cost of the actual removal. You've got the financial loss should a failure occur if you don't remove it. Uh, you've got the potential loss of life if failure were to occur and if someone were to die. But you've also got the ecological community benefits. So the approach is convert them all to a dollar to often using a lower niche of pay survey or contingent valuation methods, something like that. That is, we're going to convert everything back to dollars because we're economists and we like dollars. And then we're going to choose the alternative that maximizes our net present value or maximizes the benefit cost ratio, depending on if time horizon is an issue or not. So this is the traditional benefit cost analysis. That is, we convert everything back to dollars and we proceed. This does assume that non-commensurate outcomes can all be converted back into dollars and that we're comfortable doing that. So deaths converted to dollars, ecological impact converted to dollars, financial loss converted to dollars, not a problem. So it does assume that. And it assumes decision makers are risk neutral. Um, that is, they, they're not risk averse. We're happy to base it on expected value. 
And it doesn't account for the different levels of background knowledge underlying the probabilities that are behind this, right? Because we're going to convert everything back to the expected dollar amount. And if we're doing this for a case where we have really strong information versus a case where we don't know that much at all, but we still have to make a decision, this isn't going to reflect that at all. And a lot of people are uncomfortable with that. So decision analysis is similar in principle to uh, cost-benefit analysis, except utility theory is used to convert the outcomes into utilities. That is a quantitative measure of how satisfied you are with an outcome. So there's a long, strong theory behind this approach. It allows for non-neutral risk attitudes. That is, you can allow people to be risk averse, which most people are, uh, particularly when we're dealing with events that have potentially big outcomes. And it can explicitly represent multiple attributes, costs, lives, loss, injuries, ecological functionality, all into a single outcome measure. So there's a strong theory behind this approach. It can be really difficult to actually use in practice, though, because it's a lot of work to go through and do a utility assessment for, with a decision maker. It's a single decision maker paradigm still as well, so it's designed to help one person make a decision. It's not designed to help a group make a decision. <coughs> we had a project where we were doing this uh, utility-based analysis with NASA for their Mars exploration mission and trying to help them create a utility function for exploring Mars. And we spent months just developing the utility function. You can't do that when you're trying to make a tree risk management decision for a single tree. Right, so there's some practical issues with this approach. Then we get to robust optimization. So cost-benefit analysis, decision analysis, they really focus on finding the best alternative. And that's the best in the sense of expected, maximizing expected value or expected utility. Um, this really ignores deep uncertainty. That is uncertainty that's hard to characterize probabilistically. Things when we just don't know. And it's hard to even see how do we get more information sometimes. Robust optimization is very different. It says, well, let's find a solution that will do well in a lots of potential future scenarios. But let's not pretend like we know the probability of what's going to happen in the future. Let's assume we have kind of the space of potential outcomes in the future. And then let's find a solution that does as well as possible across all of those potential futures. So no, it's not going to be the quote optimal solution in the sense of maximizing expected utility, but it's going to be robust. That is, it's probably if, if we miss, we're not going to miss by as much. Because the problem with some of these other approaches, like cost-benefit analysis, decision analysis, is they're they can be pretty fragile. Here's the best solution with all these assumptions, and if my assumptions are wrong, then this looks terrible. Where lots of population says, yeah, we got a lot of assumptions, but we're going to find a solution that does well across lots of different potential futures. And then robust decision making, you can be as kind of an extension of robust optimization or not. It's, it's, they're, they're parallel approaches. So this seeks to evaluate how robust different alternatives are to possible future states of the world. This one tends to be a little more qualitative than robust optimization. That is a little less mathematically challenging, though it can still be hard to do. Um, rather than returning a single solution, it says, OK, well, here's all the alternatives you wanted to look at. Here's a measure of their robustness in, in the future under different possible outcomes. And then there's an approach that says, OK, let's extend that and say, let's find creative solutions. Yes, these are what you said the alternatives were. Now let's see if we can take different pieces of these different solutions and figure out, well, this is one that will do well and better than what you had before. So this has been most widely used in water resource planning and management. So it's designed primarily for natural resource management and water resource planning and management at a fairly large scale is where it's been used. So there's potential, perhaps, to use this not at a single tree scale. It's still too complicated computation for that, but at a forest, a forest scale. OK, so a few thoughts on these different risk management methods. So I'm a professor. I'm supposed to get up here and say, yes, the most computationally complex methods are the best, but they're not. Um, not for what we're trying to do here. RDM, robust optimization, decision analysis, they're far more complex than is needed for most risk management situations. Um, yeah, they're great methods if you have a particularly high value iconic tree, maybe you want to do a decision analysis. But I would not recommend that this is the way to go if you're trying to do risk management in practice on the ground for individual trees. The precautionary principle could be useful, but be really careful. Because a strict interpretation of it could lead to widespread tree removal. Right? So if it could cause a problem, we don't do it. So if the tree could cause a problem, remove it. Well, that's not what we want to do. So you have to be really careful with the precautionary principle to uh, apply to this sort of setting. Similar with alarm, that it could be useful again, because you, it's a little softer because you have that reasonable um, test in there, which you have to then really carefully define what you mean by reasonable cost. And you have to be careful that it doesn't bias you towards tree removal. Okay. A uh, bit of a cost analysis or a qualitative standards based approximation of this might be particularly useful. Right? So you can think about what are the, the costs and benefits of keeping the tree, what are the costs and benefits of removing the tree, and the tree in this way. Can, could we develop a way to say, okay, let's standardize some of that? 
The challenge here is that different decision makers have different preferences and different risk tolerances, right? So I, as a father of three children, have a different tolerance for a risk with a big tree sitting next to my house than my neighbor might. Well, how do we customize these sorts of analyses to those different settings? Okay, so one possible hierarchical approach, and this is loosely based on something the EPA had put together in the late 80s, early 90s, of saying, well, we've got kind of three levels of risk. We've got de minimis risk. That is risk that's so low, we're not really concerned about it anymore. And we don't have to do anything here, right? No analysis needed, acceptable risk, we move on. Then we have unacceptable risk, risk that is so high that we have to do something, if at all possible. That is, if it's feasible, do something. So this is more where you could apply the precautionary principle. Right, so if the failure of that tree is imminent and it's going to fall on a child's bedroom and crush the bedroom, we should probably do something about that. And then you've got the middle part, and this is where life is harder, but this is where most of the decisions are. Uh, is that the risk is acceptable, but it's higher than we'd like. That is, it's not so unacceptable, we just have to do something about it. So then the question is, how do we make those decisions? So this is where things like minimum cost analysis could be particularly valuable, possibly a LARP or if you really want to get fancy RDM if you're looking at a forestry scale. So this is one possible hierarchy. It's been, this isn't original with me. Um, well, the middle part of how we view that is, is a little different than EPA suggests, but EPA has come up with this type of approach and others have as well. Okay, so a few concluding thoughts. The framework adopted for risk management needs to be flexible. Right, there's a, a, a risk if it's too rigid that we're imposing one set of preferences and risk tolerances and values on everybody. Because different people have different preferences. Some people really want to keep their trees whenever possible, and they're willing to accept more risk. Other people say, no, I don't want to accept risk. Risk is, I, I want no risk. Well, you can never get to zero risk, uh, unless you have infinite resources. But different people have different preferences, and we need a framework that's flexible enough to reflect that, and that means there's not a one-size-fits-all necessarily when we get to risk management. Because some situations will require more complicated in-depth assessment and analysis. In other cases, a simpler, non-quantitative, that is purely qualitative approach are exactly what you need. So if we think about trying to create a risk management standard, uh, which a lot of industries are doing, how do we incorporate that flexibility that's inherently a little bit opposed to the standardization type of approach? There are risk management standards for other industries that might be helpful, but use them cautiously. There's a lot of problems with them. There's a lot of papers that appear in journals like Risk Analysis saying why the ISO risk management standard is not very good. Um, and there's a lot to be learned about what didn't work in some of these other things. So if there is an attempt to create a more standardized approach, I think there's a lot that could be learned from seeing what's been done in other places. I didn't realize we were going to keep questions to the end, so I was going to ask your questions, but we didn't do that, do that yet. And that's my house with a tree sitting on it. Um, <laughs> that was a windstorm last March, and there were no visible defects in the tree beforehand. It was really wet. Okay.